Hey everybody, we're here. It's been a little bit since we did one of our Bible readings for the YouTubes. Um, so I, I got the VW Family Farm. Well, I'm watching it on YouTube on my Roku TV. Uh, she has a really good video she just released talking about things going on in the world and maybe the way we should be looking at things. Highly recommend that if you want to give that a listen, but we're going to hit pause. Um... We're going to restart our Ezekiel here because we're in chapter 40. I do have, I'm, I'm a little tired tonight. And my, uh, it's been a really busy week at work. So I'm, I'm mentally tired as well. But I am getting started back on this YouTube reading here. And I'm going to also study some other stuff after this video is done. Um, I've got my well, giant print Bible here, but I've also got my study Bible here because I want to see if there's any chapter 40 notes. Yes, there are. So we will, uh, we'll go ahead and read those and then we'll read chapter 40. How about that? Before we read, let's do something uh, a little different. I've done this at least one other time. Let's pray before we read. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord. We thank you for the time that we get to spend with you and your word. Father God, there's a lot going on in today's world. There's a lot going on with people on social media. There's a lot going on with some of the advances in technology that they're bringing about that just to me don't feel right i know a lot of people think it's just technology just like a lot of people think halloween's just halloween but there's no way that i'm going to celebrate a day that is celebrated for the man who betrayed you the man who tried to come against you the man who's trying to sow discord, seeds of doubt, terror, frustration, anger, and any other horrible word you can think of into our lives as a ruler of this world. He's the prince in the power of this air. He ain't in hell yet. You, you tell us that in the Bible. He has not been cast to the lake of fire yet. So we pray in the mighty name of Jesus for just the ability to put on that whole armor of God to get closer in our walk with thee to be more like you every single day and less like our I, I usually say our earthly self but the truth is it's our worldly self. We don't need to sit on a fence and dangle a leg on each side. Either we're a child of the king or we're choosing to stay in the world. I just pray everybody just looks into their heart and understands where they're at. If you're dabbling in stuff that the Bible tells you is wrong, I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. We're going to fall short. We know the verse. I went over it plenty of times in my, in my Bible readings, Lord. But just be with my family watch over them be with those who are sick lord heal them in the like manner as you see fit lord i i if you see fit i know you are all powerful you can do anything i mean just last year we seen somebody come back who was lost come back to life on national television in the middle of a football game we saw it with our own eyes. It happened. There will be some naysayers that will say, no, he was resuscitated. No, this medical personnel did this. How in the world did they know how to do that if it wasn't for you providing the knowledge for that to happen? And how in the world do we know that they're the reason he came back? Because I know for certain it was you. You raised him. Because you weren't done with him yet. He's a child of yours. He professes his faith. And you said. 
Your journey ain't yet over. I got more work for you. Father God, be with us. Father God, thank you. Father God, Be with the brothers and sisters in the family. I don't care what denomination they are. Denomination could be, for all we know, personality driven. As long as they hold true to what it is we teach in this Bible. If you want to call it the core tenets, if you want to call it that hard truths, the, the parts that we cannot separate on, it. they have to be there. You are the way, the truth, and the life. There ain't nobody else who can get us to heaven just through you, Jesus. You did come through Mary and virgin birth. You, you, you gave us the gospel. You paid that ultimate sacrifice. You were buried and you rose again. You were tempted by Satan and lived on this earth. You lived a perfect, sinless life. You were the spotless lamb. So, Father God, we thank you immensely. We can never thank you enough. There is absolutely nothing that we could do to pay that price you had to do it for us we thank you for allowing this, the apostle paul and the evangelists and the missionaries and all the people in the early church who reach out to the they, they reach out To us, to those who weren't part of Israel, so that we could be adopted and grafted into the family. So, Father God, be with us. Allow us to be the beacon you want us to be in this world. Give us strength. We love you. And we praise you. Now we're going to get to reading your word. We pray that as we read your word, that what you intend for it to mean will just be like it's coming off the page to us, Lord. Don't allow us to just haphazardly read your word just to say we read it, we got it done. Allow it to grow us and fill us. Give us the discernment we need as we read it. And for us to see what you need us to see at the moment. You need us to see it. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. All right, everybody. I will just flip open to Matthew chapter 5. What's this? Caption three. I don't know if I'm supposed to read. I'm going to read this. Because as I was preaching, I was holding it still. And my body opened up. Or my Bible opened up to this. While I had it open to Ezekiel. I was sitting here holding it like this as I was praying. And it flipped over itself. So let's see here. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. This is what Rick is teaching on, on Sundays. He's doing a sermon on the Mount series. Huh. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you 
and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Gotcha, Lord. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Do not hide your witness. We are told to go tell. That's why I do this YouTube channel, because I struggled with being an introvert. And I think I'm getting better. But when I would be talking to people, if they wouldn't let me finish and they would just talk over me, I might try once or twice. But if they continue to keep ignoring what I'm saying just so they can hear themselves speak, and that may not be why they do it. They might just be excited or they may just be unconscious of the fact that they're forcing themselves upon the conversation. And it may just be that to me it feels forceful, but if you can't wait till I'm done talking and you have to talk over me, then you care more about how you were going to respond and what you were going in my this is how i see it you care more about how you were going to respond and what you're saying that you could care less what i'm even trying to say to you you think you already know what i'm going to say and you're responding to what you think i'm going to say you don't take and have enough consideration to listen to what i'm going to say that's how i feel but in the same token I also have to realize I'm asking them to understand how I communicate so I have to start learning to communicate in their way as well and that's a difficult one because there's some people they, they just are not good communicators they would they get very forceful in their opinion and in their conversation and they get louder and they try to force their their aspect upon you. It could be even when they're asking questions. But that's why it takes all kinds. That's why there are all, all different kinds of teachers. That's why you have some who are soft-spoken, monotoned, because there are people who learn that way. Then you have others who are like Rick and he gets in some jokes. He He's very knowledgeable. He's He just teaches. He's a good, good teacher. You have some who are just bombastic and energetic and be yet info driven as well. And they, they are strong, strong teachers as well. And I said, good teacher for Rick. He's a very strong leader. Very strong teacher. Great pastor. But it's the different personalities. For different aspects and different things I've learned, there are different things, I, different ways I need to hear some things from me. I'm one I learn if you when I read the Bible I read it out loud I get more out of reading it out loud so that's what I do um, and I do it for YouTube here started doing it uh, for my YouTube channel because I wasn't in the word I had to get in the
I think it's hilarious that my Bible opened up to right where, in this, right where we're at in the scriptures at church on Sunday. So, anyways, this is the Ezekiel series. The Lord wanted us to hear that tonight, so we heard it. Uh, the next caption above verse 17 of Matthew is Christ on the law. I'm going to go ahead and read down here. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. That's a monkey wrench in a lot I was taught growing up. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise. Nothing shall pass from the law until the heaven and the earth will pass. Until all be fulfilled. Whosoever thou shalt break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Teach what the Bible says. It doesn't say you won't be in the kingdom of heaven. It says you'll be there. I mean, it says it right here, verse 19, Matthew 5. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments, even the least ones, the small ones, and shall teach men so. So if you're teaching them not to follow what it tells you to in here, there's many places that includes. Many places that includes. Um, we won't we won't read Ezekiel four, verses eleven through fourteen, or sixteen. Actually, the whole chapter of four. Um, For many are called, but few are chosen. There's something here I'm, I'm looking for real quick. Bear with me here for a second. We're only at 19 minutes. Okay. 
I'm reading in Mark chapter 16 right now, if you're wondering what I'm doing. Jesus commissions the eleven. It says none of the stuff he taught in here will pass until the heaven and the earth pass. In no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever thou shalt break one of these least commandments shall teach men so. So if you do not teach what he taught, what he said would come about, what he said would here, then you are, it doesn't say you won't be in the kingdom. It says you'll be the least in the kingdom. But here we go. Afterward, this is a chapter of Mark 16, verses 14 through 18. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Shall. Not shout, would, did, shall, present tense. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs... Okay, here's the thing. <sighs> This was hard for me to break hard knowledge that was imparted upon me growing up to a degree. Not to the degree of a John. Uh, I won't say the name. I'll stop there on the name. Not to the degree that some popular teachers teach cessationism. But... In reading the Bible, in what we just read in Matthew, that that stuff don't this stuff don't end until we come into the unity of the faith, until the heavens and the earth pass. That means that they are still here. God is still the same. Seventeen. Notice the exact same use of the word shall as in verse 16 where he says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned present tense by the way shall that is present tense so let's read verse 17 shall we And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Okay, I don't want to do that one. Sorry, don't want to do that one. Nope. Nope, nope. No, And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I grew up with a lot of people that didn't believe... In laying hands and praying for healing in a certain context but they believed in anointing a head with oil and praying for healing but in doing so 
the pastor would always anoint the head, then the members of the church would gather around. Guess what they did? They all reach out and touch the one they were praying for. What exactly are you doing when you reach out and touch the one you're praying for? You're laying hands on them and you're praying for healing. I was always confused why they would teach against that growing up, but then do it, but yet call it something else. Oh no, we didn't lay hands on and pray for them. We anointed their head with oil. Yeah, you did. You also put your hands on them and prayed for them for healing. That's laying hands on them. But it's okay because you're allowed to do that. And I'm not negating that. I'm negating the fact that you wanted to criticize others who did it because it wasn't what you called it. But it was. what this verse 18 in Mark 16 called it. Oh, by the way, see what color those words are in? When something was ingrained in you really hard, sometimes it can be difficult. But sometimes it's better not to pull that band-aid slowly. That's why when I read and study the Bible, I pray for his wisdom, his understanding, his knowledge. What he intended it to mean to begin with. What I am at a level in my studies and my faith to be able to comprehend and understand without getting mixed up because there are some things in scripture that the first time you read it you're not going to notice it second time you read it you're going to notice something different but you're not going to it you may not even think about what you noticed the first time there's going to be times you're going to read scripture pretty much what i've done with a lot of ezekiel and you just don't get it you get aspects but it's not clicking. Because there's a chance that's not what you need at that time. That's not the scripture you need to be reading. So. I just felt like that needed to be said. So we are 27 minutes in. Sorry for the long video. But we got to get Ezekiel. Chapter 40. So that's enough commentary there. And there's like four paragraphs in the study Bible on Ezekiel. I'm just going to read the chapter for you all and let some of that marinate. It says, The New Temple of God. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year, after that, the city was smitten in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold, with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall shew thee. For to the intent that I might shew them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. And behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about, and in the man's hand, a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and, and hand breadth. Not, I said breadth, it's breadth. There's a D before the T and the H. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the eight, one reed, and the height, 
one reed. Then came he unto the gate which looketh toward the east, and went up to the stairs thereof, and measured the threshold of the gate which was one reed broad, and the other threshold of the gate which was one reed broad. And every little chamber was one reed long and one reed broad, and between the little chambers were five cubits. And the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate within was one reed. He measured also the porch of the gate within one reed. Then measured he the porch of the gate eight cubits, and the post thereof two cubits. And the porch of the gate was inward, and the little chambers of the gate eastward were there were three on this side and three on that side. They three were one measure were of one measure and the post had one measure on this side and on that side and he measured the breadth of the entry of the gate 10 cubits and the length of the gate 13 cubits the space also before the little chambers was one cubit on this side and the space was one cubit on that side and the little chambers were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side. He measured then the gate from the roof of one little chamber to the roof of another. The breadth was five and twenty cubits, door against door. He made also posts of three score cubits, even unto the post of the court round about the gate. And from the face of the gate of the entrance unto the face of the porch of the inner gate were, were fifty cubits. And there were narrow windows to the little chambers and to their posts within the gate round about, and likewise to the arches. And windows were round about inward, and upon each post were palm trees. Then brought he me into the outward court, and lo, there were chambers, and a pavement made for the court round about. Thirty chambers were upon the pavement, and the pavement by the side of the gates over against the length of the gates was the lower pavement. Then he measured the breadth from the forefront of the lower gate unto the forefront of the inner court without and hundred cubits eastward and northward. In the gate of the outward court that looked toward the north, he measured the length thereof and the breadth thereof. And the little chambers thereof were three on this side and three on that side. And the posts thereof and the arches thereof where after the measure of the first gate, the length thereof was 50 cubits, and the breadth 5 and 20 cubits. And their windows and their arches and their palm trees were after the measure of the gate that looketh toward the east, and they went up into the seven steps, and the arches thereof were before them. And the gate of the inner court was over against the gate toward the north and toward the east, and he measured from the gate to gate an hundred cubits. After that, he brought me toward the south, and behold, a gate toward the south. And he measured the post thereof and the arches thereof according to these measures. And there were windows in it, and in the arches thereof round about. Like those windows, the length was fifty cubits, and the breadth five and twenty cubits. And there were seven steps to go up to it. And the arches thereof were before them, and it had palm trees on this side. And another on that side upon the post thereof and there was a gate in the inner court toward the south and he measured from gate to gate toward the south and hundred cubits and he brought me to the inner court by the south gate and he measured the south gate according to these measures and the little chambers thereof and the posts thereof and the arches thereof according to these measures and there were windows in it and in the arches there of round about it was 50 cubits long and 5 and 20 cubits broad. And the arches round about were 5 and 20 cubits long and 5 cubits broad. And the arches thereof were toward the utter, co utter court. Utter. I wonder if that, shouldn't it be upper court? And the arches thereof were the utter court were toward the other court. And palm trees were upon the post thereof, and the going up to it had eight steps. And he brought me into the inner court toward the east, 
and he measured the gate according to these measures. And the little chambers thereof, and the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, were according to these measures, and there were windows therein, and the arches thereof round about. It was fifty cubits long, and five and twenty cubits broad. And the arches thereof were toward the outward court, and palm trees were upon the posts thereof on this side, and on that side, and the going up to it had eight steps. And he brought me to the north gate, and measured it according to these measures. The little chambers thereof, the posts thereof, and the arches thereof, and the windows to it round about, the length was fifty cubits, and the breadth five and twenty cubits. And the posts thereof were toward the utter court, and palm trees were upon the posts thereof on this side and on that side, and the going up to it had eight steps. And the chambers and the entries thereof were by the posts of the gates, where they washed the burnt offering, and in the porch of the gate were two tables on this side and two tables on that side, to slay there on the burnt offering and sin offering the trespass offering. And at the side without as one goeth up to the entry of the north gate were two tables, and on the other side, which is at the porch of the gate, were two tables. Four tables were on this side and four tables on that side, by the side of the gate eight tables, whereupon they slew their sacrifices. And the four tables were of hewn stone for the burnt offering of a cubit and a half long, and a cubit and a half broad and one cubit high, whereupon also they laid the instruments wherewith they slew the burnt offering and the sacrifice. And within were hooks and hand broad fastened round about, and upon the tables was the flesh of the offering. And without the inner gate were the chambers of the singers in the inner court, which was at the side of the north gate, and their prospect was toward the south, one at the side of the east gate having the prospect toward the north. And he said unto me, This chamber, whose prospect is toward the south, is for the priest, the keepers of the charge of the house. And the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priest, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok, among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister unto him. So he measured the court a hundred cubits long and a hundred cubits broad, four square, and the altar that was before the house. And he brought me to the porch of the house and measured each post of the porch, five cubits on, his, on this side and five cubits on that side. And the breadth of the gate was three cubits on this side and three cubits on that side. The length of the porch was 20 cubits and the breadth 11 cubits. And he brought me by the steps whereby they went up to it. And there were pillars by the posts, one on this side and one on that side. That's chapter 40 of the book Ezekiel, describing all the dimensions of the temple. It's been 38 minutes. Let's see what this Ezekiel says here on... All right, 41 through 48. The final nine chapters of the book are clearly a unit. They spell out the construction of a new temple and a new order of worship for Israel. Much succession has been engendered as to the identity of the temple described in these chapters. The suggestions include the following. One. It is an ideal temple that was never built, or perhaps a rebuilding of Solomon's temple. The measurements of this temple, however, do not fit those of Solomon's temple. Also, the motivation for revealing nine chapters about a temple never to be built is not apparent. Two, it is Zerubbabel's temple built after the Jews returned to the land. The measurements of Zerubbabel's temple, how ever are nothing like the glorious temple envisioned by Ezekiel. Three, it is a figurative representation of the church. So a figurative representation of the church. This view is taken by amillennial scholars who view all kingdom prophecies in the Old Testament as harbingers of the New Testament church, which is said to be God's kingdom. This view is inconsistent since it takes Ezekiel's earlier prophecies, 
the ones that have been fulfilled as literal, but the present prophecy of a rebuilt temple as figurative. Four, it is a literal temple yet to be built. In favor of this view is the fact that the measurements of the temple given in these chapters do not fit any temple or tabernacle mentioned in scripture. So these measurements do not match or measure up to any temple that has existed as of today. So it more than likely will be something in the future. That's what I'm getting from that. Okay. It therefore awaits fulfillment which can take place only in the time of Israel's blessing and restoration during the millennial reign of Christ. Gives us cross reference of Revelation 24 through 6. There's uh, another little caption here that goes all the way. Ah, so that paragraph was about chapters 40 through 48. Okay. There's another.